Welcome. I'm Frederica Newton, the president of the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation. My experience with the Black Panther Party began long before I officially joined as a 19-year-old college student. My mother, Arlene Slaughter, who was the real estate broker for the party, would often pose as a buyer to help secure several offices for the party. I, on the other hand, would steal food from the co-op grocery store where I worked to feed students at what I didn't know was a Panther school. Today, I am the president of the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation, which gets its namesake from my late husband, the co-founder of the Black Panther Party. The foundation is a cultural institution based in Oakland, California, and our mission is to preserve and promote the history, ideals, and legacy of the Black Panther Party. The following video is a documentary from the Oakland Museum of California that reflects the party 50 years later. It gives just a glimpse of the dedicated people and passionate workers that made the party possible and why the history deserves to be kept alive through a dedicated museum of its own. We are so thankful for the Oakland Museum's dedication to keeping this history alive in the city of Oakland, the birthplace of the Black Panther Party. Please do enjoy the film. I was working for the city government of Oakland, California at the time. And I was concerned that we had very few politicians. And some of the young people were running around saying, black power this, black power that. And I'm saying, hey, you, can, well, you guys ain't gonna get any kind of power until you get take some political seats. Political seats. Yeah, city council seats, county supervisorial seats. Oh, them the white man seats. I think you better make up your mind to make it some black folk seat if you want to get some power. In 1967, I was at Lincoln University, a historical black university. And someone gave me a copy of Ramparts magazine. If you were awake and concerned about the world and wanted to know more, Ramparts was it. And as I opened the magazine to look at the article, there was a picture of Huey Newton strapped to a hospital gurney with a bullet wound. And I decided to leave and drive across the country to become part of the Huey P. Newton Defense Committee, but also to join the Black Panther Party. Because I read that it was an organization created not just to end police brutality, but the upliftment of all, as the term was then, poor and oppressed people in the world. And that was the kind of organization I wanted to be a part of. At the time, when I joined the Black Panther Party, Huey Newton was on trial uh, in the city of Oakland. And my job at that time was to make sure that Huey arrived at, at court and left in one piece. You know, so the Central Committee, which is the governing body of the Black Panther Party, they used to say to me, whatever happens to Huey, better happen to you first. So if something bad happens to Huey, it better happen to me first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing, okay. My work with the Black Panther Party was really an outgrowth of the kind of family activism that I was blessed with. Uh, my mother actually founded the Huey P. Newton Defense Committee which was an outgrowth of an organization that had been sort of called Honkies for Huey. Uh, my mother did not consider herself a honky, but a legitimately concerned social activist who wanted to write something that was wrong. We were white, effectively, most of us, working in predominantly white communities. But we felt at the time that the kind of example and the kind of programs and the kind of perspective that the Black Panther Party had was right for us uh, as well. It was 1966, I graduated from high school, and the Black Power Movement was 
in the air. The Black is Beautiful is in the air. Um, James Brown was song was popular. I'm Black and I'm Proud, you know. And uh, we would be at home and we would be listening to Malcolm X speaks on the album, you know. And, and, and it felt like contraband. It was for us in the black community, especially aware students, it was our 9-11. We tried the Olive Ranch, we tried peace. We will no longer accept them just coming in and killing us. We're going to defend ourselves from now on and also inform our people about their legal rights. So thus was born the concept of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. I think like so many people from Oakland, it's always been a part of my DNA. It's always been something that I've assumed. I've always had Panther alums or Panther members be my teachers, my guardians, my, my caregivers. So I think I think about Black Panthers the same way I think about hip hop. I was born in 84. Both have been around my entire life. I believe that uh, we've heard about the Black Panthers when I was in middle school, but I can't really remember it. Um, to be honest, I think that uh, the before I came to the museum to learn about it, I never really understood what it was. I heard about it, like the name, but I never literally understood like what happened, why, where it happened, stuff like that. I first became aware of the Black Panthers around six or seven years old. Um, through family history, my, fam my family was telling me about one of my Uncle James that was murdered by the Oakland police, and the Black Panthers came and supported my family behind that. In seventh grade, I had a teacher, and I can't remember his name, but I can remember his face very vividly. And actually, the first thing that we studied was the Holocaust. And I had such a visceral reaction. I cried, I cried, I cried, I couldn't stop crying like for days. Like, it was ridiculous. He just started feeding me information about social movements, the anti-war movement, um, and eventually the, black, you know, the civil rights movement, and then eventually the, the black liberation movement. And so that's when I found out about the Black Panthers. Um, but it wasn't in a school book, it was a book that he brought, you know, totally separate. So my mother and father were both uh, Black Panthers, and affectionately the children have become known as Panther Cubs. My father is Emory Douglas, he was the, he is the former Minister of Culture of the Black Panther Party, so he was responsible for a majority of the artwork that you see related to the Panthers in the newspaper. But in terms of really understanding uh, a global perspective of what the who the Panthers were and what they did. I didn't start learning that until college when I attended one of my father's first lectures. But my grandmother, on the other hand, my mother's mother, she would talk to me and she would say, you see those boys standing there on the corner? If the Panthers were here, they wouldn't be doing that. They'd have something to do. When I was in high school, sometime around 2002, for some reason I had this inclination to read about the past. And um, I was not satisfied with what I was being taught in school. So um, I found the People's History of the United States uh, by Howard Zinn. And I remember reading, um, kind of z uh, zoning in on the 60s and 70s. And I, f I read about the Panthers and I had never heard about the Black Panthers. We never learned about them in school. We learned about hippies and we learned about draft dodgers and all those things. But um, hearing about a group of like young black radicals in California was like a completely new thing to me. When I saw photos of Kathleen Cleaver or Angela Davis, I felt uh, like I was looking in a mirror of myself. But at the time, you know, I, I had like straight hair. You know, you, I grew up in a small town, so I, you know, you kind of try and blend in. But the person who I wanted to be was kind of more those images that I saw. I was about 15, 16 when I first heard about the Black Panther Party. It's so crazy. I heard from, heard from it from, from school. The fact that I was a young man not knowing anything about, you know, such powerful history. I feel like it was no priority letting young men of color just know about the, the power struggles, of power to all the people. This is um, an integral part of our society. It should be taught across a range of different 
uh, subject matter. You know, these are historical elements that really shape who we are, how we engage in government, what um, we should expect from government, um, and how we uh, perceive what change we can make as contributors in society. You bring out the rebel in me, the dark velvet feline tender and fierce, a beautiful black panther. You bring out the West Oakland African in me, the warrior queen who took burnt land and grew culture like forest on indigenous burial ground. You are the one I would try to stay home for. Maybe, just maybe, have another baby for. Allow you to enter my sacred spaces and pray at my altar before dawn. You, only you. You bring out the 79th and Lockwood in me, the 92nd and Hillside, the attitude that melts plastic and sets your libido on fire. Phonies get scared, but you, you bring it out and get ignited. So I keep it lit 100% for you. You bring out IET, Angola, and Brazil in me, the Atlantic and Caribbean Sea, the diaspora black in me. You bring out the Olmec stone heads with cornrows, the Mayan comedic connection, the Ifa Santeria and Candomblé in me, the Pentecostal Vodun high priestess in me. I could lead thousands of slaves to freedom and still come home and surrender to you. You bring out the black-eyed peas and collard greens on New Year's Day in me, the starvation fast on Thanksgiving in me, the no religion having sinner in me, the questioner of all things, the pretty girl with ebony eyes, the one that Stevie Wonder made songs about, the one that lures tourists into ghettos, favelas, and shanty towns, the one the gentrifiers seek, you bring out the quilombos in me, the angoleta and hyena and zinga in me. You bring out the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, church on Sunday, talking in tongues in me. And it's just Friday afternoon. I now pronounce you all mine. I will paint your body in red ochre, douse you in the fragrant scent of God's liqueur, you can play in my locks when we're done. I will cross your heart with my beads of sweat, anointed in lilac wine. Now everyone will know you are mine. You, my love, only you can get this. Love the way an Oakland woman loves. Come, let me show you now. Being in the Black Panther Party changed my life in every way. My heart opened to new ways of being. I was very shy, and I realized, for instance, that I had to step forward and speak because so many people, after a point, were being jailed and killed and jailed and killed, that it was important for all of us to take responsibility for uplifting the communities we were serving. The Black Panther Party changed my understanding of generosity and compassion uh, because we gave all of the time. I, we worked 19-hour days. And by the way, the median age of a Black Panther Party member was 18, 19 years old. So my mind was uh, um, expanding 
my heart was open and I was using my physical body, pushing it to its limit every day. The Black Panther Party became a place where people came to solve problems, right? So to me, when I was 17, we were talking about starting a breakfast program, actually feeding kids. No one had done that before, right? And so those kind of programs w enabled me to stay in the organization because each, when you have work on a program, it's so fulfilling to you that each day that you wake up, that you know that you're doing something positive in your life. You're making a difference. You're feeding people's kids. You're escorting somebody's grandmother or grandfather to the bank so they won't get robbed. So with those kind of programs uh, are embedded in you. They make you a, a, stronger, uh, a stronger person and makes you eager to go out and do more. Uh, it was my work volunteering at one of the Black Panther Party's free clinics, which got me interested in medicine. I had actually dropped out of college uh, to do this work. And I actually went and discussed returning to college with the leadership of the Black Panther Party, whether they thought it would be useful and, and good and the right thing for me to go back and try to become a doctor. They thought it was a cool idea. <laughs> they said, we need doctors. And uh, that's actually how I ended up going back to school and finishing school uh, and going on to medical school and becoming a physician. Never had I experienced so much death month after month after month until I joined the Black Panther Party because the local police in all of the cities where there were party chapters and the governments were bent on wiping us out. When you skirt that close to losing your life, you don't take any moments for granted. The, the highest example of that is the day that I got the phone call that John Huggins, my husband, and Al Prentice Bunchy Carter, my dearest friend, had been killed on the UCLA campus in daylight. Then three months later, I was arrested for conspiracy to commit murder, a mur murder I did not commit, and I spent two years incarcerated without my baby daughter. So John was killed. I was arrested when my daughter was three months old. And when I, the charges against Bobby and I and others were dropped, my, my daughter was two and a half. So that changed my life, her life. Everything was changed. Personally, they've shaped who I am and how I think, and you know, particularly the women, you know, Erica and Elaine. To see warrior women in positions of power and warrior women standing up in the face of power and taking the consequences for doing so, um, I think it shaped my character. It shaped how I carry myself. It shaped my belief about you know where and what women should be in the struggle. The work that I'm doing focused on improving outcomes for boys and men of color is really rooted in uh, the work of organizations like the Black Panther Party. What I saw in the Panthers is just a, a awe-inspiring hope and belief in themselves and one another, in the community, um, and in the possibility for change. I'm really concerned about mass incarceration and the amount of black people who are in prison today. Uh, it's outright a form of slavery and it's something that has ravaged the black community all around the nation, but specifically here in Oakland and, 
in Alameda County. There are 375,000 people who are formerly incarcerated in Alameda County, which is about a quarter to a third of the population. Uh, we've been spending so much money on locking people up and, and just having them sit there and rot. And, uh, disproportionate amount of black people. I really feel that as long as we are being murdered at a rate of what I believe is more than one every 28 hours, um, it's hard to move to do anything else. I think it's hard for people that, that, who don't live in our communities to really understand the weight of that, right? Um, and so for me, I, I th there's all of these other ways in which we need to get liberated, but getting the pigs out of our community is number one. I think one of the issues that the Panthers brought up that back then was a really radical idea but now is very mainstream is like access to clean, healthy food as a human right um, and uh, land sovereignty, essentially. The reality of racism, which has been entrenched in this country since its inception, still exists. The pervasiveness of racism in police departments across the country and police violence still exists. And perhaps most recently, I have to add that the threat of fascism in this country still exists. We now see rising onto the national political stage a bigoted, bellicose demagogue who attracts a significant following. And uh, I find this extremely scary. I don't see that we have successfully transformed our society <laughs> into the kind of vision we had way back then. We certainly tried our best in our limited way and uh, the struggle continues. The legacy of the Panther Party uh, is the community work. We did the day-to-day -day work. I mean, I literally put down my, my violin, you know, put my career aside. It wasn't ye till years later that I went back to school. So all that time to work in the civil rights movement, you know, was a, sacri was a great sacrifice, so. And when I talk to people, they say, well, that's happened a long time ago and we're in 2016. I said, well, the Black Panther Party started 14 medical clinics in America. Two are still open today. There are two cities in America, in Portland and Seattle, where people are still receiving services from an institution set up by the Black Panther Party in 2016 today. Kids are receiving a breakfast today, every morning, because of the Black Panther Party. People know they have sickle cell anemia or the sickle cell trait because of the Black Panther Party. So all these things make a difference to people's lives because it's life and death. I would say the legacy of the Panther Party is um, a legacy of resistance. It's a legacy of rebellion. Uh, it's a legacy of justice. Um, and these are all things that I believe, you know, America is firmly rooted in. Um, this is how our country began. Um, uh, seek, with people seeking uh, freedom from tyranny, freedom from oppression. It was one of the best things of moving to Oakland, right, that a lot of my heroes were here. They're a source of inspiration, both because of the work they did, but I think also the anger and the rage that boils up in our bellies when we look at what was done to them by this government. When we look at how some of them are still paying the consequences of what was done to them by this government. Um, that that serves as, you know, part of the fire that keeps us moving, keeps us working, and also keeps us very clearly aware of the enemy we're dealing with. The Black Panthers represent something very important for the culture of Oakland. We have a very unique social justice organizing culture here. Oakland is almost like an incubator for social justice uh, movements and, and, and tactics, and uh, a lot of that has to do with the, the Black Panther Party. You know, young men bigger than me, they'll pick me up and give me this bear hug while they're holding me one hand and holding up their sagging pants with the other. And this is what they tell us, we love you. You put your life on the line for us. We know we got issues out here and we're ready to work with you to solve them. 
I think the legacy, what they wanted us generations later to remember today is that you have to fight for what you want. And that doesn't mean like physically, but you gotta put in some effort and show that you really want it and good things will come. And I would like to us to be remembered, not only as servants of the people, but as that movement that was bringing us uh, to a place of harmony and balance. Black bodies glisten in hot sunshine. Blood lets from open wounds and covers ghettos full of starving children. Hungry for comfort, hungry for justice, hungry for liberation. Cooling libation comes in the formation of a party. Much needed relief dressed in black leather jackets and black berets, set atop fully nappy heads, furrowed brows, and focused dark eyes that seem too much to look the other way or turn the other cheek, a valiant rejection of meek-minded passivity that lulls the people to sleep. Working in concert with their oppressors in return for empty promises of equality somewhere on a distant horizon. The hollow sound of one entering the chamber demands freedom now and echoes through project houses, social service agencies, and government institutions. This was the promise of revolution. Demonized, glorified, feared, and rejected. No matter, the work moved forward with a single-minded focus on freedom. The people were thrilled, the politicians terrified, the world afire with love for black skin, black language, black music, black power. Sacrifice is so big, there is not enough room in my mind to overstand what you gave, what you built, how you wept, what you felt, how you strategized, what you organized, how you were attacked, and how you fought back, and all of what you lost, your youth, your families, your friends, your freedom. You ignited the hopes of generations of black nations, inspired millions to stand tall and fearless in the face of an impossible enemy, to push through the sewage of capitalism, the scourge of racism, the lie of the American dream. You taught us to fiend for our freedom, to demand it at any cost, to reject any fear of loss, and to build across ideologies to imagine society where the underdog wins. Little black girls, and Little black boys saw you in their reflection, inspiring a rejection of Ken and Barbie in favor of Huey and Elaine, dreaming of being just like you someday. And I did too. Nappy-headed seventh grade me found you buried deep in a book placed high on a shelf in an empty library on a hot Vegas Sunday afternoon. I had learned about King and Parks in school, but there had been no mention of you. And as I studied, I started to bloom to question authority, to challenge my teachers, to push back the narrative. Became less conscious of my hair and more politically aware. Built the courage to return stares of racist rednecks on Vegas streets whose hatred poured down their faces in Vegas heat. I stood brave inside your courage and tall inside your legacy. You carried me through and out of that godforsaken town, landing me here to your birthplace where the heart of the panther beats on. And I see you. I see your pain buried beneath personas you put on when you walk out your front door. I see wounded warriors speaking at rallies and being honored at dinners. I see strained budgets and bodies that push forward in spite of it all. I see new generations trying to emulate you and failing. We cannot be you. We can never be you. That was your time and your space. There is no turning back the clock. The way we honor you is to walk forward along the path that you have laid, praying with moving hands and feet while doing the work in your name. The prevailing myths tend to be that the Panthers were dangerous that they were, um, uh, they were thugs, that they were uh, radicals without a cause. And I think that, you know, that these were all myths that were spread uh, in order to uh, defame them, in order to discredit them, in order to paint them in a negative light. I don't know criminals who, 
you know, who feed people breakfast in the morning or escort seniors to get their checks cashed or get bus transportation for people in the community to ride buses to go to prisons so, they, so we can keep the family unit together. I don't know any criminals that do those kind of things, but we were grouped in that kind of category and all we were trying to do is better the community. The Black Panther Party was anything but a racist organization. The Black Panther Party rejected a racist vision. Racism implies the ability to oppress another people because of the color of their skin or because of their religious belief. And the Black Panther Party was in no way in a position or had ever sought to do that. They had a deep and profound understanding of what racial oppression means in this country. But they had a class perspective on where this oppression originated. And that this struggle that we were all involved in wasn't in the end about race. It was about changing class dynamics of oppression. And that was part of what made them such a threat was that they were about uniting movements of oppressed people to build one united movement where black power mattered and brown power mattered and yellow power mattered and red power mattered. These other people tried to say that we were the opposite of nonviolence. That wasn't the point at all. The right to peaceful protest is nonviolence, right? Peaceful protest, First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America. That's the law of the land, that you have a right to peacefully assemble and peacefully redress your grievances. A lot of times when I was out traveling growing up, they said, oh, you're from Oakland, was it dangerous with the Black Panthers? Or is, I just couldn't think of anything further from the truth. Um, every Panther I've known has been committed to freedom in a really tangible way. But to hear them addressed as terrorists or to hear them addressed as, um, as violent or um, anti-American even, I feel like the Panthers did something that was more American than anything, dissent. And so I feel like in, in a really real way, the Panthers did are the best Americans I know. I never realized that at the time that, uh, that I was the first female to join. It was at a conference at UC Berkeley years ago, and we had a panel with all the men of the party and all the female, and, um, and Bobby Seals was there. He pointed me out and said I was the first female to come into the office. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I was. I think at the time women, you know, young women, we didn't think of it as being, oh, you're a male, you're female, you have to do this, and you have to do this just because you're a woman. Uh, we did everything because the work had needed to be done. And so uh, the guys peeled potatoes and served the kids just like the women did. I think people get mixed up with uh, uh, the women's liberation movement. And we, <laughs> this is pre all of that. I never forgot one time I got to Chicago there for the first time. <laughs> and we came from the big rally out of the church. You know, it's five or six, seven hundred people over there. And we got back over to the headquarters and they had this big long table. You could sit 20 some people around this long table. And then suddenly all these sisters come out with platters and platters of fried chicken, three or four platters, you know, bowls of greens and cornbread and potato salad and what have you, et cetera, and sitting it on the table. And then I noticed the sisters stood back against the wall, about eight or, eight, eight, eight or nine of them. I said, aren't you sisters going to eat? Oh, we don't eat until the brothers finish eating. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you talking about? Yeah, Chairman, you see, the sisters got to wait for us brothers out here, you know, uh, to eat first. I says, crap. And the guy was, I says, put that chicken down. He's getting ready to eat something. <laughs> put that chicken down. I says, I hereby give you a directive. Now, you did the work here. Obviously, you cooked all this food. And these guys are getting ready to get all the choice pieces and leave the crumbs to you. I said, that's crap. That's pure exploitation. So there was uh, male chauvinism 
uh, elements in the Black Panther Party, but we worked it to eradicate it. You couldn't refer to women outside of their names. You couldn't, the B word and those kind of things. You could not disrespect the sister in the party. Women in the Black Panther Party had uh, every opportunity to advance. There were women in the party that ran chapters like Erica Huggins ran the New Haven chapter. So in the Black Panther Party, you learned to take, take orders from whoever was in charge. Whoever was in charge was qualified to be in charge. So even if you was a male chauvinism, if you didn't like that person, you couldn't show it. Or if you didn't like women being in, in the party or holding b b positions, it was time for you to leave. I don't like the word regret. Um, it's kind of a pointless emotion, I think. We were very young people. We were impassioned and we were dedicated and we were committed, but we were young. <laughs> and with youth comes excitement and vigor and energy and it also comes naivete and uh, lack of a big perspective sometimes or oftentimes. So. I personally have come to reject the use of arms as a way of solving the big problems that we face in the world. I don't and will not ever oppose a group of people or an individual who feel it and find it as a last resort necessary to take up arms against legitimate and overwhelming oppression, but I feel there's tremendous risk in the use of any kind of violence. We had a lot of guns in the cultural mix of the time, and I'm not at this moment criticizing that, but for myself, personally, I, I, I find that um, use of the gun as a metaphor for uh, the legitimate struggle of peoples, um, an image that I, that I personally don't, don't like and don't connect with now. Regrets. Yeah, I do have some criticism of, the, of things we did. Uh, for instance, uh, profanity. We were, for a period of time, the Black Panther Party was caught up into this free speech movement kind of jargon where we would say what was on our mind, we would cuss and use foul language, and older people in the community are not really for that. You know, so that turned off a lot of people, people who go to church or religious, you know, and our at a certain point of our legacy, the party kind of strayed away from working with the church in the community, right? So our, our understanding at that time was some kind of, either you're part of the problem or part of the solution kind of, you know, uh, concept which is, was incorrect because a person could be part of the problem and part of the solution at the same time. That's a dual nature of things. When I had my child, my daughter, we had, I guess, a child development center. I guess that's what it was called, CDC. And so I thought that you place your child in the CDC and she gets raised up while you do all the work, you know. And I missed, I missed out on a lot. You know, so actually it wasn't until after I left the party that I began to understand a lot of things about myself. I was in the moment and I never made judgment on anything that happened in the moment. I just was in the moment, you know. So anyway, yeah.
in place of every liquor store and check cashing place in every community in the United States. <laughs> I don't want just a picture of me and Huey standing up somewhere, you know what I mean? I want the grassroots brothers and sisters in various programs, you know what I mean? Those programs were the thing that gave the Black Panther Party real character. Wow. I'm so glad you asked that question because I think I should design it along with Emory Douglas should design it since we're both artists. And I, I imagine two youth, male and female, um, at a forefront, the vanguard and the community behind them. I will build a monument in, in Bobby Hutton Park in West Oakland. It's called the Firmary Park. I would change that name. I would take that sign and throw it to the curb and put up a sign that says Bobby Hutton Park, the People's Park. The first image that pops into my head is the fist. And like I can imagine just a giant like black fist um, would be really neat. Oh, it doesn't need to be phallic. That's one thing about it. It could be round. It could be um, pyramid shaped. It could be more ethereal. Where would it be? Well, you'd think Oakland, of course, you know, because this is where we originated, but I think it's even greater than that, like Martin Luther King, it's greater than that. They put, I think it should be in Washington, D.C., right along with, with the rest of them, you know? To get political with it, you could put it across the street from the OMCA in front of the courthouse. That could be really impactful. I highly doubt that would happen. The fact that there is not a monument says a lot. And I think that is a, a mistake. And I think we should be uh, uplifting all of the positive contributions of folks who have worked to resist, who have worked to reform our society for the better. And in my mind, that's what a Panther monument would do. Uh, it would affirm and uplift uh, uh, the value of all those heroes who contributed to paving the way for us. Let's call a spade a spade. Let's call a pitchfork a pitchfork. Let's just say we know what a posse look like, what a mob can do. We know about chasing ghosts. We know about finding ourselves in dark rooms. We know about safety and numbers. Let's admit that the town people ain't never been afraid of the giant, that the body has always been bigger than the head, that the power has always been with, of, and for the people. So let's just tell the truth. Let's just be honest. Let's talk back. Let's march to firmary. Let's outline some points and let us speak of police who will step over our sleeping children to shoot their fathers and ask why they woke and ask why we have guns. We cannot forget how whales sound escaping from a siren or a boy. Let us call little Bobby's name. Let's call little Bobby's mama. Let's put her on the phone with Wanda Johnson or Sabrina Fulton. Let's talk about how easy it is to choke, how America's gravest mass shooting is durational, collective. Let's say wounded knee and never again. Let's say move on HQ and never again. Let's say it in the same breath as Flint, in the same water as everywhere we have been drowned. Let's say America and mean necessarily the trail we wept to get here, the choppy ocean that fought to kill us. Let's say Los Angeles and Philadelphia and Accra and mean the parts of the world who knew revolution as we did, black and impoverished and just coming back from a war like always say, let's talk about money, as if the first U.S. bailout wasn't stocked in the hull of a slave ship. Oh, but we ain't supposed to talk about that. We ain't supposed to talk about cotton. We ain't supposed to talk about that gin. We ain't supposed to talk about Jim Crow. We supposed to be post. We ain't supposed to ask for what's owed. We're supposed to be thankful to a tyrant. We supposed to kowtow. We supposed to back down. We supposed to not talk about our ache or what we've missed or how we ain't never had a language or a flag or even a proper family reunion. We are never going to know the names of the people who died for us to live in terror. Let us admit that the idea of Africa is still an offense punishable by death. We are not to dream of going home, not to speak of what has been stolen, not to feed our children, not even to let our hair take flight. We ain't supposed to do anything but die, not nothing. We supposed to die. We supposed to not even know we supposed to die. We supposed to not speak that we know we're supposed to die. We're supposed to watch our sisters rub cracked chalk on their eyes. We supposed to sit and eat stale crust and look on from the outside. What kind of party is that? Let's start our own. We supposed to sit here and wait till somebody let us? Let us stop waiting on freedom like it's the whooping cough. Stop hoping freedom is gonna court us on a Thursday date night. Quit crossing our legs and biting our time and biting our nails. It's our birthright and they will lie to us and tell us we are violent for wanting peace. Peace is our dowry. We wed to a democracy that keeps taking off its ring. We married to a decadent system that mocks squalor and honor. We saw what they do to our leaders. We see how they trying to string us up. 
There are bodies on the asphalt. There are members in holding. There are lines drawn all around us, and they close in and tight. There's a courthouse. There's a free breakfast. There's Emery's pen. There are Tarika's fingers, Sonia's poems, and Bobby's plans in kitchen. There are instruments of light and joy. There are folks waiting on orders. There are children in the hallway singing songs about our mothers. These blues people in their black leather. There are teenagers sneaking into our meetings. There are old folks who are both afraid and resentful. They didn't do this first, but some did. Some dusted off their pistols and got right to it. Right here on Grover MLK. Right here on 10th Street. Right here out front of McClyman's and Merritt. Come on, real revolution. Come, real revolution. Come, real fire and fake alibi. Come some Sunday when some brother comes comes to with a visceral realization that he lost sanity to a country that would have his breath on a plaque, would have his head without thinking and mounted. He's either gonna wanna get even or get freedom. The whole universe stands to benefit if this black man is free. The truth of the matter is white folks' freedom depends on ours, and we've outgrown a binary that excludes all other comrades. We talking about all the people, all the people, all the people. Let's take all the power, all the power, all the power, all the people, all the people, all the people, all the power, all the power, all power to the people.